Uh, this is Eric Jackson. It is my pleasure to be talking with Robert Pinsky and Lawrence Hobgood. Uh, welcome, both of you. Pleasure. I guess we're, I'm sort of welcoming uh, Lawrence to Boston, although he's on the West Coast right now, actually. Right, Lawrence? Yes, I'm in San Francisco. Okay, good, but good. Always nice to be welcome to Boston. I hear you were just here in Boston a couple weeks ago to to do something together, too. We did. Just last week, we uh, celebrated uh, the release of uh, Ginza Samba. Uh, I should be letting Robert say this, but it's uh, Robert, uh, uh, selected Robert Poetry translated into Spanish, and it was a very excellent occasion. Uh, that was a great night for me, because Luis Alberto Ambrogio, the Spanish translator, uh, came up. And uh, we did Spanish and English, and we did poem jazz with uh, Stan Strickland, who will be our special guest at the Regatta Bar, too, and Lawrence. And for me, it was like a family party. I just loved having Luis Alberto, uh, the translator, meet the musicians. And uh, I'll always, one of the great prides of my life is that Lawrence and Stan had not worked together until we started until oh. we started doing this palm jazz thing together. And uh, I can hear and see how much they do like playing together. And I, I love having having been the uh, uh, what, what is the word the nexus there. Well, you know, I, I'm sure you know this, Robert, but uh, Stan is one of the gems here in uh, in Boston. Oh yeah, he plays everything he can get his lips on almost. <laughs> Well, and he's he's a tremendous vocalist. Right. Yes, that too. Yes, you're right. You're right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that night, that night at BU, he played bass clarinet, he played alto flute, he played tenor, he played alto, and he vocalized. Oh, he did. Yeah. Uh -huh. he, he and I, he and I have a thing we've been doing lately uh, when we do these uh, performances. Stan vocalizes, and I'm speaking. We're doing a kind of a vocal duet between a singer and definitely a non-singer, and uh, we like the way it comes out. Uh, so, so uh, Robert, you you had worked with Stan before, but it was the first time for Lawrence? Well, it, we have this, I've worked with those two many times now, Right. but the first time was through me, but I think it's a few years now. I know we've done, uh, we've done performances out on the Cape in uh, Wellfleet and in Provincetown just about every summer for years now. Uh -huh. And uh, Stan, Stan, and uh, in fact, on my my MOOC course, uh, Stan and John Lockwood joined. Oh, uh -huh. so yeah, we've we we've worked together quite a lot now. Uh, tell me how uh, the two of you started uh, working together. Well, uh, I had become friends with a gentleman named Richard Conley. Um, he uh, has a, I, I, I refer to it as a concern um, in, the, in the business sense because they do, uh, it's not quite a label, uh, it's not quite a record label and it's not quite a publishing house, it's both, uh, called Circumstantial Production. And um, uh, this is when I was still uh, performing with uh, the singer Kurt Elling. Mm -hmm. And uh, Richard knew that... Um, I sort of uh, it's, it's sort of a strange thing to say you specialize in, but but sort of spontaneously accompanying spoken word was something that I had done quite a bit with Kurt, and uh, Richard seemed to think nicely that I had a knack for that, and so we were performing up there at uh, Scholar, and Richard uh, got Robert to come. He got him to come. I think Robert actually wanted to come here a show because he took me a little bit. Um, and uh, uh, we met that night uh, and talked about it. And Robert, I think, uh, if I recall correctly, it wasn't much more than two and a half weeks later we were in the recording studio. We went into the studio, and I knew Richard because Richard had asked me permission to, uh, uh, to use a, a poem of mine for uh, a, a vocalese performance of, of the, the great Wayne Shorter oh. composition, uh -huh. Speak uh -huh. No Evil. Uh -huh. And uh, so I was invited, partly because I had just very happily granted permission to use my words with uh, Speak No Evil. 
and that was the kind of uh, spur. And I said, oh, I would love to hear the show. And uh, we hit it off. And when we went into the studio, um, we hit it off, too. I remember the first thing that happened was Lawrence, who was a very good reader, started explaining to me all the thoughts he had about my poems. And uh, all the I what he had about your poems? All the, all the what he had about your poems? All the thoughts. All oh, the thoughts, thoughts, thoughts. All those ideas. Thoughts. Okay. Uh -huh. And I said, thank you very much. That's very nice. But uh, let's not think about all that. <laughs> don't, don't, don't worry about interpretation. Please just listen to the rhythms and the vowels and the consonants and the little uh, spoken tunes, the little melodies of the sentences, and uh, let's just approach it uh, musically. And uh -huh. I must say, Lawrence got that immediately, and uh, we had a good time in the studio. He had uh, he would just put the text of a poem on the desk of the piano uh, in the studio, and. Uh, Treated as a as the head for as a piece of sheet music, and he's going to improvise off that. Yeah. Uh, it, is that fair enough, Lawrence? Uh, it, it's 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 a very fair characterization. I do want to say, from my point of view, um, Robert is is perhaps uh, uh, too humble to put it this way. But but when I knew that I was going to be collaborating, interacting with Robert Pinsky, I I, I led Robert's poetry. Uh, some of it in the past, but that's a little bit different. So I got books and I studied <laughs> uh, for a week. And so when we went into the studio that first time, I was in that state of mind of, uh, of, of okay, all right, well, I've got myself deep into this. And, and now I think I understand what he's saying here and what he's saying there. And um, uh, the reason that that's important is because what Robert said is totally correct. What I needed to do was forget about all that uh, and just listen to the sound of what we were doing um, rhythmically and uh, in the inflection of his voice um, and the feeling that was being engendered. But, uh, and I know Robert agrees with this, that, that having done all of that work, uh, it, it's one thing to forget something that you've looked at deeply as opposed to not having looked at it deeply in the first place. Right. Um, so I, I think that that did have uh, the, the, the the homework, if you want to call it that. that mm -hmm. I done. Uh, it did have a big impact on what we did, even though for me to do what I needed to do involved sort of consciously forgetting about it. Well, yeah, you don't have to think about it if you're. It's music. Uh, the emotion and the ideas that you might not even be able to say in words. The emotion and all the thoughts you've had. That will come out if you're if you're playing the music the way you want to. Huh. That's right. That that sort of leads me to something else. Uh, I know um, uh, Robert, you at least played some saxophone. Um, is uh, how much is is uh, music a part of your poetry? And Lawrence, how much was poetry a part of your life? Uh, say before this collaboration? Well, there's no question that the first thing I wanted to do when I was a teenager, the largest ambition I had was to somehow grow up to be Dexter Gordon. <laughs> I, wanted be, I wanted to be that tenor player uh -huh. who just hears another chorus and another chorus and more emotion. I'm going to do it this way and then that way. And... Um, the joke I was repeat is the only thing that held me back from being a great tenor player was a deficiency of talent. <laughs> the, the one obstacle. That was the o o only obstacle. That one thing, huh? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everything else was in place. Uh, but I, I still, I, I still, I have the real book up on my little keyboard in my study, and I get out my horn sometimes. No, you do. Uh, uh -huh. Well, but in a very, believe me, I was a high school player in a very amateur way. Uh -huh. uh, but I did fall in love specifically with that um, the vocal quality of the tenor and the emotional range of the tenor. And uh, from when I started writing poetry, I was always imagining something like the great tracks. You know, that's what I was was thinking about, you know, I was thinking about in particular uh, uh, Dexter's ballad album, the Coltrane ballad, I, I, 
something in that um, ballot treatment uh, of that kind of player was my measure of whether you're getting to the emotions you want to get to in writing. Uh-huh, uh-huh. What about you, uh, Lawrence? How, how how much of a part was poetry, uh, how much of a part did poetry play in your life? Uh, it, it, it's always been in my life. Um, my dad was a theater professor. Uh, my mom was a, an Appalachian folk artist. Oh, okay. Um, and so I sort of grew up in a very literature-rich uh, environment, uh-huh. and uh, and poetry was certainly always there. I'm not going to lie and say that I was a, 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 a big, huge a consumer of poetry as I grew up, mainly because I just was so focused on music. Right. Uh, but I, I read Whitman, and for a, a period in my late teens and early 20s, I went through an odd cheap stage where I just was really reading the ode to everything. Uh-huh. Um, uh, and uh, then there's a poet that my mom turned me on to, named Mae Sarton, um, who I always loved poet. a lot, really. I identified with her poetry, uh, still still do uh, love her poetry. Um, and then, of course, uh, there's the way that that, that informs um, my, my take on lyrics. Uh, I think really, really good song lyrics uh, are, are a different kind of poetry, but they need to have an element of that and one of the things that I've been fortunate enough to be allowed to uh, develop sort of a specialization in is reinterpreting um, songs in different ways from their original versions. And that always had to do with looking at their lyrics and and forgetting about the music for a minute and reading them as poetry. Um, And uh, it's, I'll just try to say it benignly as I can, it's a little bit of a mystery to me why more musical interpreters don't do that. It's sort of an obvious thing to me to just sit down and look at a lyric and then think away think about a way a song was originally done and uh, and say hmm boy that's uh, I think that comes off as 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 poetry it's sadder than the hit was or mm-hmm. it's, or it's happier and more upbeat than the hit so uh, the meaning of of words as poetry has has been a dominant thing in my thinking uh, especially as I've gotten older uh-huh. Do, you, do you think uh, uh, the way you approach, approach uh, poetry is different than, say, the, I guess they call them the beat poets of the 50s and 60s, because there are a number of, uh, of collaborations between poets and, and musicians. Uh, one that comes to mind right off the top of my head is uh, Archie Shepp, but there were a number of yeah. other collaborations, too. Yeah, Archie Shepp. Uh, there's often I've seen I, I've seen a video of Kerouac reading with Steve Allen, right, recording right. behind him on the piano. Uh-huh. Uh, Ginsburg was interested in it. Um, I would say that, with the one exception of tracks I've heard of Kenneth Rexroth reading with San Francisco musicians he knew, that's more accompaniment. It's it's more it's more theatrical in a way and less musical. Than what we're trying to do, it's related to it, and uh, certainly when I started out, I was very aware of that. Uh, and the direction we're trying to go is concentrated more on the fact that every sentence has a melody. It's not just rhythm; it's pitch. Okay. And uh, it's a different kind of. I hope it's more. You know, the, a great pleasure, I think, that kind of got me through difficult teen years uh, was making music with other people. Uh-huh, and uh-huh. Uh, the, there's a joy to that that I thought was gone from my life forever. Uh-huh. And then, thanks to Lawrence and Richard Connolly at Circumstantial, I got it back. Okay. So, for me, I think more about what I wanted to do and experience a little bit back in those days playing music than I do about the beats. I think a lot of people expect something more like the beats when they come to our shows. And uh, I think they're surprised, and I hope they're pleasantly surprised. Uh, is that, when you, when you start talking about beats, of course, I start thinking about uh, rap music. So is, is that what makes the difference between 
what uh, the two of you, or is that one of the things that yes. makes the difference between? I think, yeah, I think what we do is much more like rap music. I sometimes call it geezer rap. Call it what kind of rap? Geezer. Geezer oh, rap. <laughs> but, but I, you know, uh, I, the idiom is completely different. Okay. It's a different musical idiom than rap, and it's a different verbal idiom uh -huh. than rap. Uh, my poetry is based on the way I talk, the way I'm talking to you now, Eric. Right. Uh, so it's the jazz idiom, and I suppose you could say I come out of the idiom of, you know, I don't know, Wallace Stevens, Marianne Moore, whatever the, the modern American poetry idiom is, I suppose going back to Whitman. The idiom is different, but the principle is exactly the same as the principle of rap, which is to say that between these sister arts of music and poetry, it's not a rigid dividing line. They they segue more gradually into one another. Okay. And the threshold is an interesting place. Uh huh. Um, Lawrence, are there any some other poets, uh, poets rather, that you could think of that you think of that as uh, as musical, very musical in their poetry? Oh well, Billy Collins, I think. Uh, is, uh, is, 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 is it can be very musical. Uh -huh. um, uh, there was a project a few years ago where uh, the pianist Fred Hirsch set a lot of pieces of grass arrangements right. to uh, to music, and and that, uh, to me that was kind of interesting in that in that I I don't when I read Whitman I don't necessarily think uh, in a musical sense. Uh, as much as I love his poetry, uh, but Fred really, you know, he, he brought it out, yeah. which I think illustrates an interesting point. And to get back just briefly to what Robert was saying about the the uh, uh, relationship between what we do and rap music, um, I think that uh, he, he, he's totally right about that. But a fine point that the distinction uh, is that rap music is um, like like most popular music from uh, uh, really all encompassing uh, way of looking at rhythm. It's pretty cookie cutter. Uh, not to get into too technical musical language, but it, it isn't too technical. Uh, you know, it's all in four four time. And basically, all of the rhythm is going to be right. And if you think about what the potential is in the grand, huge scheme of things for what can happen with rhythm, that's very, very limited. Okay. Um, uh -huh. One of the, one of the, I mean, it's just very, very simple, you know. Um, uh, and it's what appeals to the masses, and that's, and that's. That's cool, but I think one of the great things about what we do is, I mean, we have yet to perform to an audience where people don't respond to Robert's energy and the way that he is reading the poem. There are even several instances that we always have a lot of fun with where Robert essentially demonstrates the difference between if he was to read the poem as a poetry reading, just 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 the way he would do uh, normally, um, uh, if he was visiting, uh, uh, you know, doing a lecture series or something like doing a poetry reading, and then we'll, uh, we'll he'll read the exact same poem, but this time with music, and you can hear the change that happens in his voice. And one of the ways you could describe that is that it becomes very, uh, very perceptibly rhythmic in a very specific way, but it isn't that ba ba da ba da ba 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 you know, sort of very notoriously simple thing, and yet it has a rhythm that's very, very different from if he was just reading it without music being uh, part of it. Right. Um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I think that's a huge thing about the uh, about it because people respond to it. It's rhythm. It's rhythm, and it makes you feel a certain thing. And as the, uh, I, I personally think that Robert's time as a musician when he was younger is, is has a huge impact on his consciousness about this. Okay, I sure hope so. As I was making that transition from music to poetry, a very important thing for me was the 
Dizzy Gillespie Paris Review interview. And Dizzy kind of surprises the interviewer. The interviewer wants to talk about, you know, harmony and, and you know, complicated ideas about musical theory. And Dizzy, who was an instructor for people who were piano players, would come to him for Right, life. right. Uh, I mean, he was a teacher. And he says the thing that people need to understand is that the basis of jazz, the essence, is rhythm. Oh, sure, sure. The, the interviewer says, huh? And, you know, this is a long time ago. Right. He says, uh, uh, oh, I thought the rhythm of jazz was kind of simple. <laughs> really? And, and Dizzy says, you know, not everybody can hear two rhythms at once. And uh, you, have to, you have to hear a lot of different things all at once. And it's, it's subtle. It's not, he, he even says, it's not instinct. You have to work at it. And uh, that, that few sentences that he says, uh, uh, Dizzy's in that interview, uh, were and remain a kind of guide for me in thinking about poetry and music. Uh, it's not a very long interview, but it is, uh, I, I think it's quite wonderful. And uh, it's, uh, for me, it's got the quality of, uh, of a really, really deep truth. Interesting. Uh -huh. um, you two just put out a, or just are about to release a new CD. Is it, has it been released yet? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yes, I guess so. Uh, I certainly have a copy of it in my hand. Uh -huh. Our official release party will be on the 13th at, uh, of November at the Regatta Bar. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's out. And uh, frankly, Lawrence and I both think it's, better than the first one, though we liked the first one a lot when he was talking about demonstrating my reading a poem the way I would at a reading and music. Uh, the first one has a 16th century poem, St. Johnson's Excuse for Loving on it. And as I remember, I do say the poem and then we do it together. And you're hearing, you're hearing both the same rhythms and completely different rhythms in both the voice and the piano. But yeah, House Hour, uh, House Hour has just been and you can find that on the web, I assume, at circumstantial something dot com. Absolutely, if you if you Google circumstantial dot com or circumstantial house hour, there will be. Okay, okay. And you just mentioned something interesting. You don't just perform uh, your poetry; you perform poems by others too. I occasionally do. I always like to. Uh, one of the things that we had fun with. Uh, uh, in Boston last week was uh, my adaptation of a poem by the great Greek poet Constantine Kavasi, and um, we've done it where I just read it, and then we do it in a sort of introspective ballad way, and then we do it in a kind of, um, I don't know. Darkly, darkly satirical. <laughs> darkly <laughs> really? satirical bounce. We do it as a bounce. Okay. And, uh, uh, so, yeah, just to show how differently you can do things. And I love taking a, a poem from the late 16th, early 17th century by Ben Johnson and the way Lawrence does it. In my opinion, it's uh, to use an, an old but honorable word. It's definitely hip. <laughs> I, I know, um, uh, Robert, that you have about 19 books out, mo most of which I think are your uh, collections of your poems, but you yes, also yes. done some work as a translator too. Yes, yes. Uh, I uh, and I, believe it or not, in my mind, that was a musical thing too. I uh, I have a translation of uh, Dante's Inferno, the Inferno right. of Dante, right. and it's not a great uh, stroke of how well I know Italian. It for me, it's not at all a language feat. Uh, it's a feat of what I call metrical engineering. And it's basically oh. music. Uh -huh. It's the sounds. Uh -huh. Trying to get the sounds to do an English equivalent of the uh, the speed and variety of uh, of Dante. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, I, I know that you, I uh, should mention, because we haven't mentioned it yet, you're the three-time, only three-time uh, U.S. Poet Laureate, too, Lawrence? Uh, 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 Robert, rather? Robert. Yeah. Yes, it's true. How did that happen? Um, well, really, 
it, it is a world record, but it's not necessarily because it's uh, I'm so great. The Clinton administration wanted to celebrate the year 2000, and uh, we did a wonderful project, the Millennium Project, the Favorite Poem Project. And at favoritepoem.org, you can see a video of, uh, of a young uh, uh, Cambodian-American high school student reading Langston Hughes' Minstrel Man, and oh. reading it to her family. And you can see uh, uh, it was then called Boston Gas Construction Worker, and he reads from Walt Whitman's Bees of Grass. So it's all people who are not poets or professors of poetry, just readers. Uh, and these videos of those poems, we uh, they were part of the celebration of the millennial year 2000. So, so you had something to do with assembling these this collection or something yes. like that? Uh -huh. Yes, yes, uh -huh. I did. Uh -huh. It was my my idea, and I had uh, I had wonderful helpers really from around here. Maggie Deeps was my assistant, and I don't know if you know Juanita Anderson, the sure, filmmaker. Sure. Yeah, uh -huh. Juanita was my executive producer, and I'm very proud of what we came up with. I, you know, there's my writing, there's my family from. And then I would add, not so much poet laureate, but I I, I conceived and, and, and made the favorite poem project. So those, those the books have come out of that anthologies, but the videos at favoritepoem.org they mean a lot to me. Uh huh. Uh huh. And uh, Lawrence, of course, you worked with uh, oh, Kurt Elling for was it twenty years? Yeah, twenty years. That's pretty incredible just to find any sort of collaboration lasting that long, 20 years. And uh, you won at least at least one Grammy won uh, that you won there, and I think there were some others nominated too? Yes, well, all the records that, uh, that uh, I helped Kurt make were nominated in the best vocal jazz category, and then I received also two nominations for my arranging, um, one in, I think it was 2002, and the other one in 2009 or 10. Um, but the, the uh, Grammy statue that I will admit I'm proud to have at home was actually for one of the, the uh, best vocal jazz record in the, the 2010. Uh, we won in that category, and I it turned out that I got the get a statue as well because I was a producer on the, oh, on the okay. record. So that's actually, that's actually why I can claim to be a Grammy winner is because uh, it turns out that when you win, producers get a copy of the statue as well as the artist. Okay. Now, for the for the uh, all 10 of those recordings, did you do the arrangements on all 10 of them? Pretty much, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. It was only just a couple of exceptions. I did all the right answers on those. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You uh, are no longer working with Kurt, or at least not regularly. Uh, no, that's that's correct. We reached a point where it was, uh, I think, better for both of us to uh, to explore uh, different directions. Uh -huh. So that gives you more time to uh, work on your own projects. Is that what you're doing mostly now? Uh, yeah, I'm actually crazy busy. Um, I'm very excited to be about to release a trio record. Uh, that I've made with John Patitucci and Kendrick Scott. Oh, uh -huh. um, it is uh, killer. Well, I, I'm going to interrupt. Okay, it's called Honor Thy Fathers, and I have an inside track, so I actually secured uh, a, a pre-release copy of this. And okay, I've been listening to it, and uh, I unreservedly, completely love it. It is really beautiful, and Lawrence, the way he what he puts together, backed by. Uh, Kendrick Scott and John Petitucci is uh, it's one of my favorites. It's really it's great. Really? Okay. When, when are we going to get to hear that, uh, 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 Lawrence? Late late January, really. But you know what, Eric? I can make sure that you get a copy of it before that. Okay. I'm I'm, okay. I'm happy for that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's an interesting thing. I hope you don't mind me mentioning this, but in the sort of the topsy turvy, turned over world of uh, music these days, um, uh, this is uh, uh, back in the day. 
you wouldn't have played something on the radio, uh, wouldn't have played something on the radio before it got released. Right. You just wouldn't do that. Right. Um, and uh, these days, uh, as the labels, uh, as it's classically been known, are, are increasingly um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, concerns for releasing um, already recorded material, uh, in, uh, what they call catalog, uh, and the releasing of new music uh, is increasingly uh, in the hands of the artists that are making it. Right. Um, this idea of trying to get the sound of your music out there uh, several months before it's going to actually be widely available is, uh, the, you know, there are no rules anymore. Right, right, right. <laughs> so I'll be happy to get you one, and, uh, and hopefully you'll enjoy it as much as Robert has been. Okay. Enough to do. Uh, what the label will that be on when it's out? Is, that, is it your own label? Uh, we re- I, we release that on circumstantial. Oh, that's uh, the same okay. Label as records. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, we, we will be releasing it. Okay, that sounds good. Circumstantial. Yeah. That's good. Tell us a little bit about uh, what you're planning to do at the Regatta Bar on the 13th. Well, I guess the first half will be from House Hour, the new album, uh-huh. and uh, we'll certainly play the title track of that. And uh, I'm looking forward to the second half when we have our guest artist, Stan Strickland. Uh-huh. And uh, I certainly hope Stan vocalizes. If I get to do that vocal duet with him again. And um, we, uh, as the music goes, we never have too close a plan. Okay. Lawrence and I will do. With Lawrence and I will do the first half. We'll concentrate on the house hour. It is our release party, and. Um, then we'll, uh, we'll invite Mr. Strickland up. Okay, so uh, I think I, that's 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 the plan. Is that is, uh, can I be more specific? I maybe Lawrence can. Well, um, you know, I, I think that's exactly what's going to happen, and and the only question is what which poems we won't have time to get to everything from the uh, CD, and like most. Uh, performing artists, we also are uh, excited about some new things that we're doing. Right. Uh, and we, we want to get those out there. We want to get Stan's sound out there. Um, but it also occurs to me, just to mention, uh, and I do this because I think it adds to people's enjoyment of what we're doing, uh, we truly are improvising. Right, okay. Um, and I, I think a lot of people, including people that consider themselves jazz fans, but they're not musicians, they associate that word improvisation with uh, the less um, immediately uh, and very solidly intelligible content, which is maybe a nice way of saying, you know, a lot of free-flying and free-flowing sort of busy uh, thoughts. Uh, You think about, you know, Coltrane playing 20-minute solos with a lot of notes flying and stuff like that. Right. But there, uh, there's a whole different way of looking at improvisation. I call it thematic improvisation. And was that thematic? Of was thematic? Was that what the word you, you said? Thematic? The, impro- thematic, Right, yes. right. Uh-huh. So, so uh, what, what's being played is very song-like. Um, and uh, it sounds to a lot of people so composed um, that that they they have a hard time wrapping their head around the idea that it's improvisation. Um, yeah. uh, I, 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 I want to add two things to that. The, okay. What you hear, I, I, uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of polish on what you hear when you listen to the house hour tracks, but really those are careful improvisations. So that what you're hearing, it's not like I'm no more reading a text out than Lawrence is playing note for note from some chart. We're listening to one another and changing what we do as you hear it on the tracks. It's not a live performance album, but it is recording unique improvisations each right, time. Right. Uh-huh. So that's one thing, that what you're hearing in each track is unique. We, we will never be able to nor want to reproduce one of those tracks uh, 
syllable for syllable or note for note. Right. Okay. And the, the second thing is when you see us in performing, you're not going to see me carefully reading from a piece of paper. Um, people are sometimes surprised that I'll rearrange the parts of a poem or okay. I'll decide that a certain line is going to become a refrain or I will go back, I'll go back, uh, I'll capo, uh, I'll go to El Signo, I'll do different things with the order of parts and I'll repeat phrases. If there's a phrase that ends, uh, some words that end uh, a passage and then there's a solo by Lawrence or, or by Stan, then when I resume, I re might repeat the last phrase from before as a kind of reminder of continuity. And uh, what I'm doing, I hope, is more like what a jazz player does. Uh, I'll be real frank. I think a lot of people, until they've heard us, assume this is possibly going to be embarrassing or corny. And uh, I think that works in our favor because then the surprise, because I think it's not. Okay, okay, yeah, that's great. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to uh, mention to uh, to the audience before we wrap this up? Friday the 13th oh. of November. So it's not bad luck, yeah. Friday the 13th, huh? <laughs> yeah, Friday the 13th of November. Okay. Um, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, and uh, people should come. Okay, okay. Uh, Lawrence, Robert, I want to thank both of you very much. I think uh, we covered a lot of ground in our talk today, too. So thank yeah. you very much. Many thank thanks you, Eric. Eric.